Hi, this is Matt Bainey, city editor of the Lewiston Tribune. And I'm here with uh, Stefan Weeby, sports reporter, Don Walden, sports editor, and Trevin Pixley, sports writer. And we're here uh, uh, hours after Paul Petrino was uh, fired as the coach of the Idaho football team. And so we thought we'd get, just kind of get together and talk about uh, the situation. Um, uh, Stefan, uh, you're our uh, Vandal football beat writer. Um, I, 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 I'm sure this didn't come as a surprise. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, after you heard the news today, uh, what was your initial reaction? Yeah, I think, like, just like you said, Matt, I mean, it's one of those things that wasn't, um, like, it wasn't really a surprise at all. Um, it, it, with Paul, is one of those, you know, it seems like for a couple of years now, it's been like people are saying, you know, could you, could you be fired? A lot of fans, obviously, are all, you know, for, for any team, are going to be stepping on, on stuff like that. And so, it's not a surprise at all, but at the same time, you look at his record and how, how many year after year, it's kind of the same thing. It's like they really could, you wouldn't be surprised either way if he's, he's back doing the same thing again next year. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was one of those not surprised, but um, but also it was. I don't think it, it was really a, a totally a foregone conclusion either. Um, with just the track record of what's been going on with him and with the university. Mm -hmm. Steph, um, what do you think about the timing? One game before the end of the regular season, you know, could they have waited maybe two more days, three more days to, you know, maybe announce this or I mean, what, what's your thought on that? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't the university, my understanding, it wasn't the university's plan to announce it at all. Um, they, they definitely wanted to wait until after the season. Um, and just from, from talking to somebody close to that, um, they were a little, and I think even, you know, I guess, uh, so Jerry Gall to AD is going to have a press conference um, as of the time of recording this um, tomorrow. And but she did do kind of a, an impromptu thing uh, today that I that I wasn't a part of. It, yeah, I was, they just kind of did this random way, and I wasn't there. But um, from, from hearing that and, and some other things, I don't think they they wanted this to happen this way. Um. So yeah, I, I, as far as how long they they've known or were planning it or whatever, I mean that's anyone's guess. Uh, um, I think they'll learn more about that uh, maybe when I do ask to talk to her um, and, 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 and so yeah but uh, I don't think it was their it was their plan it just kind of happened this way when the um, when obviously when Ted was the club was yeah so your thought so your thought was that you know it was going to happen but just the timing of it was a little a little odd or bizarre or a little well, off from what I've heard um from people I talked to, it was going to happen, and they, you know, and they may be new for at least a little while, but um, they weren't planning on, on probably doing it until after the season, um, which, you know, from their perspective, uh, as the university makes sense, um, and I don't want to speculate too much, I mean, I'm sure that that, I, I, I'm guessing it wasn't probably not a surprise to Paul, but that would be more speculation, but yeah, I, um, Timing-wise, it would have been a little probably smoother for them if it happened after the final game. Sure. So it, Paul was the coach at Idaho for this is his ninth season. Um, clearly, the highlight of his tenure was the 2016 season when uh, the Vandals went nine and four and uh, won the famous Idaho Potato Bowl. And uh, if anybody uh, remembers that game. If you've watched the Vandals for a long time, I, I'll say I don't think I've ever seen an Idaho football team play better than that. Uh, in the first uh, two and a half quarters of that game, they could have beat anybody the way that they played. Um, now they almost uh, uh, almost fumbled away the, the victory uh, in the fourth quarter, but, uh, but indeed they, they looked uh, super impressive in that game. Do you think, Steph, I, I, it, it's my thought that uh, 
you know, I, I don't want to say that Paul uh, uh, coasted on that season, but uh, it was probably the goodwill gained in that season that uh, allowed him to be the coach at Idaho for so long. Oh, yeah, I think I, I definitely agree with that. Definitely um, kind of something people to hang their hat on with that game as far as fans and players and, and Paul himself. Um, but, yeah, you know, funny story about that game, actually. So I, uh, I was actually at that game um, as a fan, actually. So I, you know, I went to U of I as a student, and um, I'm also from Boise. And so um, one of my best friends, in Boise, he, uh, he was a really good friend. I was at his wedding. And his company that he works for had some tickets, and so I had yeah, tickets for the game. So I just went to the game for free and actually was watching it up from the week um, as a fan, which was kind of funny because I knew, you know, obviously I knew the reporters that were covering the game, and I, you know, I covered them even as a student uh, as well. Uh, but yeah, I got to watch it as a fan and then go on, you know, with it. I know they really got to go out onto the field and, and step afterwards um, down in the Boise. So that was kind of funny. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I wish I could remember. As far as specific plays and stuff, I, I wish I could have my memory better about that game. But, yeah, this is a, a really crazy game with how high scoring it was and how clean it was. And and I, I think I agree with what you said earlier as far as the, the best of them was. Um, I think especially on offense, they were, they were just really clicking that game. Um, Matt Lenahan uh, was in control. Um, these players on offense were, were just making big plays. I, you know, wasn't there like a, a one-handed catch or something in that game? Um, that was kind of crazy. So, yeah. Um, you know, if I thought I'd had some more success, maybe that wouldn't have been the game meant as much. But just based on on just how crazy that game was and, it's, you know, a, a full game in, in Boise and, and just, just how the game turned out, it definitely – it's been kind of a, a, a memory that I think of a lot of fans and, and everybody who follows the team. All right, Steph, how many beers did you have that night? <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> uh, well, at that point, I, I don't know if I even had any during the game, um, but definitely afterward, <laughs> after we met up with some of the writers, and we went, yeah, there was, there was a lot of Vandal fans out on the town that night in Boise. And so that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, but I don't think anything embarrassing happened, but yeah, I definitely uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you know, as a fan and, and seeing all the other fans that were out, uh, so yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, I can kind of um, understand where you're coming from because as a lifelong Ohio State fan, we had went so many years without winning the national title. And then here we come to 2003 when they played Miami down in the Fiesta Bowl. And it, that, that was the game where it was the phantom pass interference call against Chris Gamble. And, you know, they, they, they called it. And we, everybody back home, we, we just went, we went eight. We were like, you got to be kidding me. And then they, they picked up the flag and then, you know, eventually Craig Krenzel led them, you know, down down to victory in the second overtime. They won that game, and, and Ohio State got their first national championship since since the '60s. So I can, as a as a fan, I can relate to that. You know, being that, you know, this was probably Idaho's biggest win in how long? Exactly. And Petrino won Coach of the Year for the Sun Belt that year too. So he's definitely banking on that success too. Mm -hmm. And that it's it's uh, I'm sure uh, Vandal fans out there who have been in Boise for of course Idaho uh, will forever have a uh, perfect record in bowl games three and zero, hundred percent win percent. That's right. And it, take that Notre Dame <laughs> and Ohio State yeah. at that. And. Uh, all three of those wins were in Boise at the Boise Bowl game. And uh, even though the Vandal uh, uh, graduates and fans uh, are, are perhaps in uh, almost equal number to Boise State people in uh, the Treasure Valley, um, Boise never feels uh, more like uh, Moscow than when the Vandals win a bowl game there. Uh, I, I've been there for one of their victories, and – 
it, it the Vandals uh, run amok uh, when, <laughs> when their team <laughs> wins the bowl game in Boise. So, and I got to imagine that that night, Steph, of the the Potato Bowl in uh, in 2016, uh, that must have been uh, uh, Vandal Central that night. Yeah, it definitely was. Um, definitely a good time. Uh, yeah, like you said, a lot of obviously there's a lot of Vandal fans in, in Boise, but you know that's where a lot of people it come from when they when they go to, to Idaho. Um, just to being the biggest city in, in Idaho, and and then you know to move back or whatever. And I I do think you know Boise State over the years has definitely definitely grabbed a lot of fans that they didn't even go to Boise State with how much success they've had. There's a lot of uh, you know, you'll see people in, in Boise State here that probably didn't even go there. And then, of course, the university is pretty big these days, too. Um, but, yeah, there's a, definitely a, a healthy chunk of, of Idaho fans. And, you know, for that matter, I mean, even Idaho State fans. Um, I, I, I think I went to, uh, I, you know, I'm actually from Boise, so, like I, like I, I guess I mentioned earlier, but um, I, I, I think when I was a kid, I went to from Boise State to Idaho State. And it was like, oh, some of there's a bunch of Idaho State fans in Boise too, apparently from from Pocatello, you know, going to that game. So it is kind of, I think Boise is kind of the uh, the hub for for the different universities as far as uh, definitely State fans, um, lots of fans from from the different places there. You know, so thinking back to that 2016 season. Uh, you know, it had been a bit of a, a, a climb up for the Vandals. Uh, they, at the end of the Rob Akey tenure uh, uh, had, had been uh, pretty bad. And uh, there was a year of independence. Uh, and so it took uh, Petrino a while to build up to that 2016 season. Uh, and, and that clearly was the high watermark. Um, Steph, if, if you can kind of analyze a bit... Uh, uh, why any guesses to why uh, the Petrino's team wasn't able to sustain that success uh, going forward uh, after the the great 2016 season? Yeah, you know, I think that's a, a good question, and I don't know if there's you know really one answer. I think there's a lot of things you can look at. Um, you know, and it's interesting because you look at, you know, Petrino's offenses, for example, and he, he really has done some good things with, you know, when they, this year, for example, they have, have had a lot of injuries and, and different quarterbacks and stuff, and they're running the ball more. You know, we've talked about that whole game year, and it, of course they were running the ball a lot, but they were doing more traditional passes with one hand. And so do so tailor his offenses to, to certain things based on what they, they should do. He likes to use a, a lot of different players. Um, good in backups and, and different packages. Uh, but it's like it, it never fully, I guess, catches steam. It's like they need maybe two weeks to prepare for a game instead of one or something. And, and so that I, I don't know if that's a coaching style thing or, or what. Um, I think you do look at injuries a little bit at, at quarterback, especially the past few years. Um, going back to even running hands got hurt a little bit, um, although he was pretty healthy. And then ever since then, you know, there was just Don Mason and, and Cole Richardson, who's, who's from Richardson, and, and they both played back and forth. I think they both were hurt. And then, uh, you know, this year there's next three or four quarterbacks with the front third. And, and, and that's a tough position to have, to have go through just so many guys. Um, but then it's like, you know, how much of that is those guys getting hurt and how much was he actually going to do that anyways? Which, <laughs> With just the style of playing multiple guys, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I wish I knew that there was just a, kind of an obvious answer why they didn't take off, you know, moving down to the big sky, or why they couldn't just sustain that success. I know, um, you know, if you just look at social media, a lot of the players obviously like him, and so he's liked by the players. Um, but yeah, just couldn't couldn't get it all together, and, and he had. You know, obviously a long time to do so. Uh, he, obviously, there's been a lot of adversity between uh, moving down to the to this side and, and so good. And, and when he first took over, they were just really bad. Uh, but then you look at the big picture, and he had nine years, you know, to to get put together some more win seasons. So he definitely got 
more of a chance than a, a lot of guys, a lot of coaches out there would have thought. All right, I I got a question for you, Steph. Can you recruit? Yeah. Do you think, in your mind, could he recruit good, talented players to come there? Yeah, that's that's another good question. I think that's another thing you see from the fans is like, oh, there's so much talent, and like he, he's not winning with the talent he has. And then it's like, I mean, look at who played at quarterback compared to like some of these guys who, you know, might not have the arms of some of these other teams. In, in Division One football, you know, I don't want to just throw a bunch of guys under the bus, but um, I, I think he can recruit. He, he obviously has gotten, you know, there's been guys that have gone to the NFL more than once in the White City, um, yeah, Ellis, obviously, and so he, he has, individually has some guys who are really good. Um, again, it just seems like another theme is like some these guys will just have like a game, a really good homecoming, or a really good showing the last game of the season or something, but it's just like throughout a season, it doesn't all come together, especially on the road. The teams have really struggled on the road. Um, looking at the numbers today, something like 1-19 to in the big sky on the road, which is just crazy how, how bad that is. Um, so, yeah, I would say there's, he, he definitely can recruit good players. I, I think if I've got the yes or no question, I would say, yeah, he can recruit. But it doesn't feel like there's consistency there. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. I'm sorry. Uh, it doesn't feel like they, they had any kind of consistently good play throughout yeah. the tenure. Exactly. Uh, but, like, you know, they'll have one game where they just look really good, and then others where they just look horrendously bad. It's like, it's like there's definitely not – I mean, you just see that this season, you know. Um, and we can go into that maybe more later. But, yeah, they're definitely not the most consistent um, consistent team. And, and yeah, it's, uh, I guess it's puzzling to me maybe why that is. Right. And I know Matt's going to broach this, I think, at some point. But overall, quarterback play, you know, this year in particular, you know, when you're playing three and four different quarterbacks, you don't find any kind of continuity, any kind of groove. And I think – in, in particular for this season, that kind of set them back. I definitely, yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, um, and, you know, again, part of that was by design. They were going to, for Zach Morris, for example, was going to be a running quarterback and have his run plays, and they were going to be mixing some guys up anyways. Uh, the first couple of games playing C.J. Jordan and Mike Beaudry was by design. As he was, it was still a quarterback battle, I guess, at that point in the non-conference. So, yeah, then you have, you know, you play four different quarterbacks total, and, and none of them, you know, I, yeah, none of them really, I guess, really got into a good groove. And I think that especially shows with with Zach Boris. I feel, I kind of feel the worst for him. He was a running quarterback who was the third or fourth stringer in the offseason. And now, in, in all three games he started have been, you know, that a, Anybody who's read my story, as I've mentioned a million times, but, you know, he's starting against Eastern, Montana, and Montana State, who are all top ten teams. And he's a guy who, even in practice, is mostly doing run plays, and that's kind of just, you know, setting yourself up for failure because he has to keep it on. It seems know, like. To, to get comfortable out there. Um, and then still, the Vandals almost be Montana State. So, yeah, I think if they've been able to stick with one guy, I think that definitely would have helped. It seems like at the quarterback position, he just – and the Vandals as a whole just have a hard time committing to somebody being the guy, not only this year, but, I mean, going back, you know, even further with uh, Petrino and Richardson, and it's just always a quarterback battle, you know, during camp, and he's had just a hard time really committing to who his guy is going to be all season. And, and, and Sherman, I don't think he really ever settled. Yeah. It just doesn't feel like he ever settled because, you know, if you look at the situation between between Mason and Colton, it always seemed like it was up in the air. Exactly. You know, one way or the other. I mean, he finally settled on Mason, but the results weren't there. And that's and, and that's not necessarily a knock on what Mason did. Mm -hmm. it, it just was the uncertainty 
it wasn't and that's it was, kind of what i feel like it didn't seem like he was ever a hundred percent committed to somebody being the guy like it was always up in the air like they'd have a bad game there'd be an injury the other guy would come in they'd have a good game injury bad play the other guy would come in. you know and it was, it was just hard for him to commit to a starting and, and I guess for the two of you guys who've been around this program the most, um, Steph and, and Matt, it, it feels like to me, ever since Linehan graduated, Scott Linehan graduated, there hasn't been any kind of continuity at that position. Would you agree with that? That's for sure, yeah. Although, not Scott Linehan. That was his dad. Oh, uh, man, yeah. sorry. <laughs> uh, well, you know. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> he, he was a Vandal quarterback too. But he was a Vandal quarterback. Oh my, it dates back that long. <laughs> <laughs> he really can't find a quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I mean, no, I guess I, you get my point. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Don. It, uh, you know, and, and perhaps that's a sign. Uh, maybe a uh, recruiting uh, weakness, blind spot, a little bit and bad luck uh, for uh, Paul Petrino that all of the quarterbacks he brought in after Matt Linehan, none ever seized the top job like uh, like Matt had, like uh, John Freeze, uh, Doug Nussmeyer, uh, any of the, the, the old... Uh, uh, the Vandal legend quarterback. That's yeah. right. Yeah, there was never a, a Vandal legend quarterback. Um, you, you know, if, if things had played out differently for some of them, uh, who knows? Uh, if injuries hadn't uh, uh, intruded, if if uh, Trevin would have been there to block for uh, yeah, exactly. uh, for uh, uh, your guy Richardson like and, he had in high school. And, uh, <laughs> when I was ever at Vandal camp and Petrino offered me a scholarship, you know, when I was out there getting sacked at yeah. Vandal camp. <laughs> I think Colton Klein signed. Yeah, if he would have offered me the scholarship, maybe it could have all been different. Yeah, yeah, and I know Colton would have. Oh, and and, and, and you know what? Or... You guys would have won the FCS title. Yeah, I, mean, I was the missing link. For the you man. were the missing link. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, you <laughs> are the missing link. <laughs> Trevin Pixley at right guard for the Vandals. And we're not talking WWE here, folks. <laughs> yeah. Talking nasty boy in the trenches. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, though, I, I feel like the quarterback struggle is, was, is indicative of the Paul Petrino era overall. You know, we, there was one really good quarterback, and he led them to one really good season. And eight other seasons? Nah. And, and I hate to say it, too, and it sounds cliche, but the quarterback position is the most important position on the field. And even in college football at any yeah. level, and that should be, you know, your main focus of recruiting. And if you're in a program for nine years and you're recruiting all this talent, everybody around you is saying, oh, you're recruiting so much talent. But the quarterback position is your biggest glaring weakness. That brings up a lot of red flags and questions, in my opinion. Yeah, and Katrina was, a, 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 I believe, a, a quarterback in college himself. And he's an offensive guy, so that's you know, completely his wheelhouse and stuff is to get in and, and doing the offense. So, yeah, it is, it is a little interesting. I was just saying, I think that makes it even more mystifying as to how they could not find and settle on one guy for a two-year stretch or a three-year stretch. Yes, I, I hear you, Vandal fan. Mason Petrino, I understand. However, what was the record? Well, let's okay. Let's unpack that a bit. Uh, so, of course, as Don alluded to, uh, there are Vandal fans out there tearing their hair out right now, saying, "How could Paul Petrino have started his son at quarterback for that long?" And it, you know, I think uh, I think for a lot of rank and file Vandal fans, the fact that he did start his son at quarterback for so long, and uh, his son's quarterback capabilities are d debatable at yeah. a, a college level, uh, size wise especially. Sure, not not a big guy, not a, not a huge arm. Um, anyway, that, that's that's his uh, biggest sin, I think, for a lot of Vandal fans. And 
Uh, I, I don't know, Steph. What uh, uh, what are your reflections on on the Mason Petrino uh, uh, starting quarterback uh, 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 controversy <laughs> at Idaho? Yeah, I think that's that's interesting because I was uh, you know I wasn't. I guess I did do a couple stories. I wasn't the beat writer during the Mason Petrino era, but I did, you know, see it and cover them a little bit. There's, you know, some sidebars and stuff. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's like obviously Mason did not have the strongest arm. I don't think anybody could really argue he didn't. Maybe he didn't really have a Division One quarterback arm. You know, at the same time, I think he was kind of doing all he could. I don't think he had a ton of turnovers. Um, he could run and, and he would do the short passes. And yeah, of course he could throw it down field still. And it's like they were still they were, they were still winning some games. And then even like you look at his his last game against Northern Arizona and he I don't have the numbers in front of me, but he had something like six hundred yards of total offense or something in that game. Like seven touchdowns in his very last game. And so you don't do that if you're not an athlete and if you don't have some ability to to very good quarterbacks would never have a performance like that. And so, you know, but then at the same time, it's like, yeah, like obviously defenses are kind of, they, they know the limitations. They know what they can do when they see him at quarterback and that they're maybe not going to have to play back as far or they, there's going to be some sort of throws and stuff. And so, um, yeah, you know, it, it's, yeah, I think that the questions are definitely warranted <laughs> yeah. there. Um, and, and, yeah, it's, it's definitely an interesting case study, so to speak, on, on that whole that whole situation. Well, and, and you know, Mason, uh, for, here's my thoughts on it. I, I mean, honestly, if he wasn't uh, – if his last name wasn't Petrino, I think in some ways he would have been a, a fan favorite because he was a, a gutsy – guy you know in a tough situation yeah and and you know very resilient uh but uh of course uh, the the nepotism uh, angle uh, got stuck in van in uh, fans heads and uh you know in you look at paul's background he played quarterback in college for his dad uh you know it's hard exactly. not to draw the parallel and say well this guy just wants to uh relive this situation with his son uh which uh you know, it, it, you can kind of understand, uh, but <laughs> but you know, it, yeah. it also can make fans maybe perhaps a little bitter. Going back to that game, that Northern Arizona game, I just pulled up stats. He was thirty-six of forty-three for four hundred and ninety-eight yards and six touchdowns. Yeah, that 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 that's a ring of football numbers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you want to you want to put the kid in Madden? That's that's wonderful. <laughs> The one thing I will give to Mason Petrino, he had a ton of heart. He did. You might not like you, you might not like the fact that he was the coach's son, and you might have all these different things that you think about him. And he, he, you know, he was undersized. He did not fit the prototypical quarterback, but he clearly had a lot of heart. Yeah. I don't know about you guys. Mm-hmm. You know, he was a Pullman High kid. Um, he was literally a local kid to the area, and he's playing, you know, playing at that level. Um, so, you know, again, if it, you know, like David Unger, a, a wide receiver, is another Pullman kid. He was definitely a fan favorite, and, and, and yeah, like like I, like Matt said, the name was a Petrino. Um, I think a lot of guys would have liked him, and. And same thing, you know, it's also the big picture, it all comes down to wins and losses, right? If he's won two more games per season, and I don't know how to win records each season or whatever, there would be a lot less scrutiny on that whole coach's son thing if they were, you know, winning a couple more games. And so, you know, definitely something to, to consider as well. Are we sitting here talking right now if they win an average of two more games a season? I don't think so. I mean, especially considering how long, how long they kept. And so, I mean, a lot of those, well, I mean, yeah, two more wins per season, that's 500 a lot of those years. Um, definitely, there was a couple years early on that were really bad. They really, I think, 
make the overall record a lot worse. Um, so yeah, you know, some of those those four and eights turn into six and six, and, and you know that's still obviously not super great. Um, but six and sixes, and then you throw that whole win in there, and and you know that's better than than <laughs> half of the rest of the teams in the country. And you know, unfortunately, Idaho is not a program that's expected. Especially these days, to win all its games, like or well, most of its games, you know, like like there are some programs out there. Uh, I, I definitely think you would still be back if they if they won a couple more. Although I think you you know then you do got to start looking at like the Montana games and the Rockford games. You know, you know you're six and six and you're losing badly to Montana and, and Eastern and stuff like they have. Um, I, I yeah, maybe that's a little different still. Um, but yeah, I definitely wasn't doing. I mean, it swings back to like what Steph said earlier when he said that it wasn't a surprise that he was going to be let go, but he also wouldn't have been surprised if he wasn't going to be let go because of yeah. the accolades he has or what he's done. So I think me and Steph had a conversation. I don't have it in front of me, but I think with his wins, he's either the second or the third most winning coach in Idaho history. So, I mean, he has – some criteria to his numbers and, and i guess to me because again where i come from that just stupefies me. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean I, we're, I'm looking, we're in idaho okay. not ohio no. right right <laughs> they fired john cooper for having nine wins a season in columbus they fired old nine and three earl bruce because every year Earl went nine and three after going eleven and zero and seventy nine, I'm just this is completely out of the norm for me. I don't understand it. I mean, I I I get the expect I get expectations because I lived it every day in the city of Columbus. Yeah, are the expectations at this place too high? Well, I'd say well, too yeah. low. Or too low. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, which way is it? Is it too high or is it too low? Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is uh, Don Walden. He's from Ohio, and uh, he, he's not fully <laughs> used to win in, in Idaho football uh, history here. No, <laughs> no, but, I mean, I, I guess I just – I'm just – I don't know. I I get it. I you know I. But is the expectations for a team like Idaho? Matt, you've been around this team for pretty much all your life. What do you believe are the expectations for this team? Well, uh, you know, I think when they went back to the Big Sky, I think the expectations got a little higher. Uh, for. Perhaps that's, uh, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that, uh, perhaps that's one reason uh, Paul Petrino is out of a job now. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, most Vandal fans who have been around for a while, they can stomach quite a bit of losing. Uh, <laughs> You're a Browns fan, Don, you understand. Yeah, thanks, buddy. <laughs> thanks, buddy. But, but even, even those Vandal fans that can uh, stomach some losing, they uh, – um, at some point, they they've had enough, and and I I think that you know this was it. Uh, the the Tubbs at the club uh, report uh, that's out there said that some alumni got together and raised money to buy out Petrino. We don't know if that's uh, uh, you know that's not been confirmed by the university or anything yet, but those are solid uh, reporters uh, uh, with, with that website. So you know we don't have any reason to doubt their reporting, um, but. I, yeah, I think that, you know, I think Petrino's tenure shows that, uh, that, that there's, there is more stomach for losing at Idaho uh, than there is uh, elsewhere. I, well, and, and granted, I know I'm kind of comparing apples to oranges here. You know, we're, we're looking at Ohio State, which is a top-tier football bowl subdivision program, versus Idaho, which was – I mean, they did play in the in the FBS. Mm -hmm. I I understand that, but 
you know, not on the same level as a, you know, a power five conference. So I maybe the fan base that can tolerate a little more losing. I know if I'm a hardcore fan of any team, I'm not wanting them to lose no matter what. I, I don't care. I want them to go 11 and 0. <laughs> you know, I. Dang it. <laughs> if, this, if this new coach at Idaho gets six or seven wins, they might sign him to a 10 year <laughs> I mean, Trevor's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stefan, are you back? Yes. Okay. I, yeah. Uh, we. And I, yeah, I wanted to add something to that conversation. I think. You know, I, I get, well, maybe you look examining more the, look at all the records of all the coaches, but, you know, Idaho did fire its coaches when they lost, which was, you know, this last couple decades, obviously, it's been a lot, but, you know, I mean, Bob AC was fired, and you, you go down the list, and these coaches just didn't win, they didn't last that long, and so it's not, I would say, an Idaho thing. You know, to back to the end of time, it's kind of like what is like this thing with Petrino, who's been here for nine years, been in Moscow for nine years. It, it's kind of the anomaly, I would say. Um, and, and yeah, and it's you know, it's, it's just interesting. It's he, like we don't want to go back to this too much as we were, you know, talking about his son and the name Petrino and stuff. But it's, 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 I think it is something that people maybe are thinking about is, is did he get a little more slack because his name is Petrino and he coached? You know, coaching the NFL, and Petrino's a name that everybody knows in college football. Um, you know, if his name had been, you know, Joe Schmo, maybe he would have been fired earlier. Uh, you know, just worth, worth considering that as well. It, you bring up a good point, Steph. I think, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, for most uh, previous Idaho coaches, either they won enough that they got a better job or they yeah. lost enough that they got fired. Uh, you know, his, his nine year tenure, uh, when you look back on the history of coaches, it, it's going to look a little out of place. Uh, you know, nobody comes close to that in recent time, a, a nine year uh, tenure at Idaho. So um, it, it's, yeah, it's kind of a strange anomaly um, in, in the scope of it, and I think uh, I think you're right. I think uh, his name helped him, and and certainly the 2016 season helped him. Uh, even the upheaval the program's been through maybe helped him. Uh, you know, when they're making all these transitions, going from the Sun Belt to Independent to the Big Sky, uh, the, the school probably didn't want to uh, change course uh, when they're in the midst of those things. And maybe even COVID helped them last year. <laughs> To, to a certain extent, maybe COVID probably, you know, expanded his life expectancy at the school <laughs> for another year. The first time COVID has expanded anybody's life expectancy. <laughs> and it'll probably be the last time, to be honest with you. I think so. But, you know, in all seriousness, if you think about it, you know, I mean, look at, if you look at his record before the pandemic hit, Anybody could you you could have made a case in 2019 to get rid of him, mm -hmm. you know, and, and obviously we didn't know what we know now, but you know he probably helped those kids through the transition through that year in the fall to get them ready for the spring, mm -hmm. you know, and even though they didn't have that great of a record in the spring, you know they still you know. He still kept them on track. And the one good thing you, the other good thing that you can say about Petrino is he really raised the level of their academic standing. Yep. They were at an 838 on the one year APR before he came. And now they're at, I want to say, a 940 over the five year average on the APR. So he raised the level of academic standing as far as that program goes. So there, if any any fans want to complain about his one loss record, which is completely understandable, you should. You know, you could also say that, well, yeah, the win loss record wasn't good, but he did bring them along as men and mm -hmm. as adults into the real world. Mm -hmm. 
so a question I got to ask too. I mean, like 2019 going into the pandemic, obviously that's a tough transition. And you said earlier, we could make the argument that he could have been let go then. I mean, let's go in even a year prior, Matt, 2018. Do you think there's an argument to be made there? He could be let go even that early? Certainly there were fans making that argument at the time. Um, I, and, and, you know, uh, frankly, I'm, I'm surprised it, it, part of me is surprised that didn't happen. I mean, it, uh, you know, the records that were being put up at that time aren't necessarily the sorts of records that uh, keep a, a coach in place. Um, I, I got to think that, uh, that at the time the transition to the big sky was, was maybe part of that. I, I think that, you know, they didn't want to have to, introduce more upheaval when there were already was plenty of other upheaval. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I know that, and, and I don't want to harp on this. I think we covered it pretty well, but I, I think that the uh, Mason Petrino starting a quarterback situation rubbed plenty of fans the wrong way. Um, you know, frankly, I, I, I think that, uh, that's the biggest issue for a lot of people. And, and, you know, I'm kind of surprised that uh, they didn't make a move at that time. Would you say that the outside circumstances are more the reason that he's sticking around? I mean, we talked more about the 2016 bowl game being the reason maybe he's sticking around that clinging on to that memory. But I mean, we already touched on a little bit COVID the transition to the, you know, the big sky. Do you think maybe that is more of the reason that he stuck around for nine years? I, I, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, it was uh, uh, all, all of that upheaval. I think that the uh, – and, and, you know, plus he, he, he signed a, a big contract after the bowl game. It would have been expensive to buy him out at that point. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think that uh, all of that – the. Uh, the bosses at the university were probably like, let's just stick with this for now. Let's see if he can turn it around. He he did once before. Maybe he can do it again. Well, if you think about it, look at his contract. I mean, I, and I've got it sitting here in front of me. He's making 400 and some odd thousand dollars. And 255000 of that is with his media stuff, his radio show. You know, all, 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 all the, you know, outside extremities, you know, as far as all the media contracts and things of that nature. His base salary is just $191,214. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? But if you add in the media stuff, it's almost 455000 Sorry, Steph, I apologize. Go ahead. Yeah, I didn't get this thing out right now. Um, so, Steph, I, I, I wonder, so, okay, Idaho has switched to the big sky, and uh, they certainly haven't dominated the league. Um, <laughs> haven't taken it by the storm. No. Um, <laughs> oh, come um, on. And, and, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that uh, uh, there were a lot of fans who didn't want to make the switch, and uh, even the fans who wanted to make make the switch probably didn't necessarily think Idaho would would dominate the league, uh, but maybe they thought they'd have a winning record in the league, and and that didn't happen. I guess can you maybe sum up for us uh, what's your best guess? Why is it that Idaho hasn't become a power in the Big Sky so far? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, I guess the most simple answer is they, well, so they won the bowl game, and obviously that bowl team was really good. I mean, they would, would maybe have not have won all their Big Sky games, because um, certainly the Big Sky is, is I think, a, a very good conference, and like let's face it, the Sun Belt, especially at the time, was not the toughest. I mean, literally bottom barrel FCS conference, mm -hmm. and so I, I don't think that you know, whoever they were playing, New Mexico State and stuff, is it, it, that much, you know, arguably worse probably than Montana, <laughs> Montana State anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, so if, 
if they, if they had gone from that bowl win directly to the next season and, and stuck it up, that would have been really puzzling. But I think one thing that kind of gets lost is the next year they went four and eight the next year, and I believe they still had. I'd have to go back. I believe they still getting had for another year. I I think but, so. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that was running right senior year, and obviously other players too. You know. And so they they directly went from winning the whole game back to, you know, kind of sticking it up. And then they go down to the big sky and they lose, you know, you lose a bunch of scholarships with that too because there's less scholarships allowed. And so that affects recruiting. And I'm sure it affects the recruiting anyway because you're going down. And so they already honestly weren't that good to your prior. And then you're not going to be making big recruiting jumps going down. And... You know, it's just maybe they just weren't actually that good. <laughs> um, it, was, it, was, it was like, yeah, the Well, okay. Uh, I, uh, sorry, I Steph. I have maybe one more question. Um, we're talking about COVID and stuff, and this was, I, I think I heard this, but this wasn't totally an original question, but I um, heard it on the, the TV broadcast or something, but I know in a bunch of other teams obviously play in the spring season. And I wonder how much do you guys think that played into some of these injuries they're having? Because, you know, like a couple of teams that didn't play in the spring, Canada and Montana State, who were, you know, obviously they're good year in year anyways, but they did play in the spring. They're really good. Uh, you look at like Weber State, who played in the spring, had a really good spring season. And Weber State is kind of taking a step back this fall. And then I know it's had all these injuries. I wonder, you know, does that spring season, you know, are guys just not able to do a spring and a fall football season back to back? I mean, that's a lot to ask for these players. Um, I, I kind of wonder if that, you know, did that explain to some of these injuries? That, that, that's, that's a really good possibility, Steph. You know, having a press season like that, you know, they played six games in the spring. And now they're playing a full season in the fall. So you're playing 17 games within, I want to say, I think they started at the end of February, the last week of February. Mm-hmm. And, and we're looking at the middle of November. So you know, about I mean, nine you, months or so. yeah, you're, you're asking 18, 19, 20, 21 year old kids to play 17 games in a nine month span. Now, under normal circumstances, you're playing 12, possibly 13. If you're in the FBS, maybe you're playing 14 and 15 games. Oh, stop now, talking about Ohio State. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 and I understand, I guess I shouldn't necessarily compare that, but if you're looking at FBS teams now, you know, they're they're playing, if you, if you mark it all the way out to uh, the national championship game, you know, they're playing – at least 14 games in a compressed four or five month span. You know, some of these FCS teams, you know, such as an Idaho, a Weaver, you know, some of these other teams at an Eastern, you know, they played, like, like I said, 17 games in a nine month span. But the other question you can say is, has this really affected Eastern? You know, Eastern hasn't seen that much of an effect, and they're like number three yeah, or number four in the nation. Had a, a good year, and I, I don't know how many injuries they've had, but yeah, I guess that is a team you look at, and, and you know, okay, they are having a good year. Um, and, and then you look at the Idaho, the Weaver State, and, and it's, it's been a struggle with injuries. But then, you know, on the flip side, I know Montana's had injuries too, and, and they've been playing some spring. So, you know, who knows exactly, but it does. It, it, it is interesting, just that that short short time period between between the two seasons. Right? No, and you and you bring up a valid point there. I mean, you know, you've got these kids who are turning around. You know, they didn't play for twelve, sixteen. I'm 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 estimating here probably sixteen months, and then you're asking them to basically play almost twenty games in a nine month span. You know, and those kids are still, their bodies are still developing. So that is a lot to ask of a kid that age. I mean, 
that's a good reason as to why Weaver State probably isn't, you know, they had been ranked and they're not ranked anymore is because the injury bug has caught up to them. You know, that is a legitimate question to ask, though. Did the injury bug with Idaho in particular catch up with them considering they played this amount of games in this short a time span? Yeah, not every football player can be a, you know, a Adrian Peterson or a Frank Gore that just, you know, or a Tom Brady who just goes for the end of time. Um, <laughs> and, you know, most players, <laughs> look at the pros, the, the average span is like three years or something. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I want to say the average running back is like 4.7 years in the NFL. Tom Brady is yeah. like, well, he's a robot. <laughs> <laughs> That's an anomaly. Yeah. Well, all right, Steph, so that, that closes the book on the Paul Petrino tenure. And so now it's time for the wild speculation part of the podcast. Um, Idaho is uh, looking for uh, a new coach. Uh, uh, do you have uh, any names in mind? Or, or uh, if you don't want to be that bold, uh, just uh, what kind of uh, what kind of coach do you think the Vandals are looking for? Yeah, I, don't, I can't say I have a, a, a list of names, but that's definitely something, um, for, you know, in the coming coming days and weeks, maybe look into that and, and come up with a list. And uh, I'm sure there's a lot of, um, I think I've seen some names here and there. Uh, but, yeah, definitely uh, will be interesting to see who people think it should be. And, and he maybe comes up with it on, on a list and stuff like that. You know, like, I think the funniest one, <laughs> and this is, is definitely, a, I guess, more of a joke, but people... Even before Katrina was fired, people are saying Nick Rolovich should be hired after just being fired at Washington State. And the funny thing is, he's actually at an Idaho game the next week after he was fired, watching um, an Idaho game. And so that that's kind of a, a funny one. I know there's some parody accounts out there too saying that Rolovich uh, should be a coach at Idaho. Um, but yeah, as far as a uh, what, what kind of coach. You know, I, and I think, and again, this is pretty cliche. I think everybody kind of says this, but it seems like just somebody could bring some excitement back to the team. You know, maybe a younger guy um, who can just kind of bring some excitement. There's, you know, as much hate and stuff as people are dropping off Petrino and, and the record and all that, I mean, I don't know, it's not been selling out of games. I mean, the, the, the fan, and it's it something that goes hand in hand if you're winning, there's going to be more fans. But, I mean, Idaho is not, as far as tickets sold, has not shown that it should be an FBS team recently. Um, so somebody who can just kind of bring some excitement to, that, that people want to watch and people are going to go watch, you know, and obviously it'll take some time to see whoever they get if they can win or not. But I, I think they definitely need um, somebody like that. He's not a, you know, not a, you know, not to say Katrina is, is, is not that way or, or whatever he is, but, um, you know, definitely not a Bill Belichick or something. Like, bring in somebody who has a little bit of excitement to him. So I got a question for you. Do you think there's anybody of the current assistants who you think should apply for the job? Uh, I mean, honestly, like, first first thought, uh, no. I, I can't think of anybody on the current staff who, who, who would jump out like that. Um I mean, it's been cool to see, you know, Brian Reeder, a former player, kind of rise up to the OC. I think he's a tough man, smart guy who probably has a bright future to continue coaching. Um, but, yeah, looking at the current staff, you can't say, like, there's this guy or this position group that, that they, they just totally deserve a shot. I mean, I would say, you know, maybe reach out to, to someone new. We were talking in the office tonight, Steph. Um, what about somebody like a, uh, a Linehan? Matt Linehan or Scott Linehan? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. E either one. Either one. <laughs> At least being on the I staff. If it was Scott Linehan, he was, you know, OC of the Cowboys just a couple years ago. I mean, I think people would be all over that. I think that would be a dream hire for sure. Um, I mean, Matt Linehan, that would be interesting. I don't know. I, just think, I think he's just like a, a GA or something going right now. I don't know if he, he has the resume for that yet. Um, definitely a smart, smart guy, though. Would it be too much money, though, considering, you know, what they were just paying Petrino, on the other hand? Well, I, 
think whoever the next coach is is definitely going to be making not that much money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think we figured that one out. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Who can they get with what the salary is going to be? What is the salary going to be? Um, but, we, you know, the coaching territory is always moving. There's always, you know, a, a good coordinator or something who's going to want to take the game just like Petrino did back in the day. So I think I think they can definitely get somebody who, you know, there's maybe some excitement about. But, yeah, it'll, it'll, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how close they're going to make the decision and, and how that ends up going. All right. So I have a question to pose to all of us here in this room and on the phone. How attractive of a job do you think this is? <laughs> I mean, I guess I, I can start. I mean, again, I mean, it's not going to be the most attractive position, but I, you know, I, I think anybody who looks at it though, and they're like, I know does have this past history as, as a good football program, and it's still a Division One, you know, it's an FCS team, but it's still a Division One program, um, and so I, I think. You know, it's not as bad as maybe some people would think. But then, yeah, you know, you look at the records recently and, and the attendance recently <laughs> and, and stuff like that. It's, you know, it's, it's definitely an upward climb for whoever gets it. And there's going to be people that don't maybe don't want to, to take that challenge. You would rather just – because it's, it's tough being a coach. I mean, you have, if you were <laughs> – the trail aside, it's either you win or you, you, you know, start over somewhere else. Or you climb up and, and move on. And so I know lately it's definitely not been a place where people advance onto that next big gig. And so, yeah, it'll, it'll definitely just be interesting all around. Guys? Well, uh, it's uh, traditionally it's a place where a young coach maybe earns their spurs and then moves on to a bigger job. And I, I think that's probably. Uh, I would say that's that's the best tact for uh, Idaho to take to uh, hire a, a younger coach who is moving up the ladder, and uh, Idaho is a rung they can stop at on on their way up. Um, and and I'll also say that uh, other than uh, Rob Akey, uh, every single Idaho coach uh, since uh, Dennis Erickson in 1981 had a previous uh, tie to the program, uh, including Paul Petrino. Uh, I, I'll i bet that if I'm going to put some money on it, I think that whoever they hire next is going to be somebody who had a previous tie to the program. Now, let me ask you a question because you bring that up. Do you think it would be good for maybe for once them to go to the outside of the yes. program? Yes, yes. So, so I think, right, like you were saying earlier about how attractive is this job. This job's not going to be attractive to somebody who is a Division One mainstay. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, not going yeah. so to so. be an FBS yeah. attractive kind of a thing. Yeah, exactly. But somebody who may be an assistant mm -hmm. at, you know, I don't know, we can say – So at, here, I'll throw an example. Out. Ohio State. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> an HBCU. Or, mm -hmm. or a lower FCS yeah. division, you know, an FCS assistant job. 100%. So what I see, so I did a little research when you told me we were doing the podcast. Um, one guy I think would be good for this job is Ian Schumacher out of Eastern Washington. So he stepped out as the offensive coordinator and the QB coach two weeks ago from Eastern Washington. He said, cited personal issues. But Eastern Washington, before he stepped down, are averaging 628 yards per game on offense. So this is a young coach. I think he's in his mid-30s, and they need to step out of the norm from hiring within the system because obviously it's not working. So they need to get out there, get that kind of young guy. And I think that a guy that is around a system that's been so successful, he has a talented guy there um, at the quarterback position, and he's going to be able to bring in some guys. I think that's kind of the direction you'd want to go. Nah. I it, it, that, I'm gonna go with what Trev said. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think that Idaho has for, as I mentioned, for well four decades now, 
has gone to that Dennis Erickson tree of coaches. And uh, uh, those people are all getting kind of old. <laughs> but do you think they went to the well once too often here? Well, you know, I I don't know, maybe. I mean, I, I, I know that uh, Paul has been fired, but, you know, a lot of coaches get fired. I mean, there were some good things in his tenure. Right. They, yeah, they were maybe all in 2016. And believe you me, I'm not saying that there wasn't anything good that mm -hmm. didn't come out of the Paul Petrino era. Obviously, there was. You know, probably one of the greatest bowl games in Idaho's football history yeah. came out of that era. You know, he actually, and he raised the academic bar for those kids. I think, you know, and, and I, that was a good point you brought up, Don. I, uh, I, you know, I know that, you know, fans don't care that much about it, but I mean, that, that really was good. Uh, there were certainly with all college programs, there were police blotter issues, uh, right. but, but. I think uh, uh, he kept his teams to a reasonable level. Um, and, yeah, he did some good things there. He really did. Um, uh, and you asked, did they go to the well one too many times? Um, oh, um, maybe. And uh, But I think Trev brings up a good point. I think it probably is time to forget about the Erickson tree of coaches. Um, it would be nice if there's somebody who has ties to the program. I, I, I think because one reason that's good is uh, because you under, if, if you've been in the program before, you understand what Moscow is. You understand what the Kibbe Dome is. Right. Because it's a, it's a unique thing. It's a big beer can. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> According to ESPN.com, folks. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe rather than specifically a person who has ties to the Idaho program, maybe just somebody who has ties to the big sky, like you mentioned. And I think, you know, there have been a lot of uh, talented coaches that have come through the big sky. I'll bet that there's a, uh, uh, some a young undiscovered gem in that mix somewhere, and maybe that's the sort of guy you're looking for. Steph, how much pressure do you think is on Terry Gallick on this hire? Oh, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I I think definitely one of a, a bigger pressure pressure situations that an AD has to to deal with is hiring the football coach and dealing with the football. I mean, that's obviously by far the biggest, you know, biggest team on an athletic program and, and everything revolves around football. So, yeah, it was, it's definitely a deal in that regard. Uh, but then you look at, you know, I think somebody on the outside would say, look at Paul, how long Paul was here in his record and like how much pressure really is there if they're going to let somebody, be, you know, lose this for about eight out of nine years or whatever. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's definitely two to the boosters, the fans, the Moscow, and, and carry yourself. I mean, yeah, I think there's definitely some pressure. Um, and so it'll, it'll it'll be interesting. I mean, especially, you you know, not to go down another rabbit hole, but you look like one of the first decisions she made was, was, was keeping um, that clause on the Idaho basketball team, who was uh, an assistant and then an interim, and, and kept him, you know, Obviously, he, he didn't have an amazing season when they kept him on, and there was some, some questions about that. And so, you know, and that's maybe a whole other rabbit hole. But, yeah, it'll be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't know. It'll be interesting. There's definitely some pressure there for sure. Well, suddenly she has to hire a football coach and a volleyball coach, right? Yeah, because uh, yeah, WP Cannon uh, decided to uh, hang up her uh, whistle. Uh, on Thursday, on a Wednesday. So, you know, you're, you're having to replace your two longest serving coaches in the per, in the athletic program. And that's just not going to be. <laughs> Maybe Terry wants to go back to Madison. <laughs> you know, and, and do a little bit of fly fishing on Lake Michigan. 
because this is not an envious position for her to be in right now. Yeah. I don't know what you guys think. Well, I, okay, I want to, um, just for a moment. Uh, uh oh, I, here I, comes I, the elephant <laughs> in the room. Well, here I, it comes. I, I want to, uh, uh, everybody to speculate about, uh, the possibility of a Nick Rolovich hire at Idaho. I've got one word, two letters. N O. <laughs> oh yeah, there's Dawn. Okay. Um let's let's look at this realistically. All right. He came from the University of Hawaii to Wazoo. He got a three and a half million dollar contract. That's three point five with however many zeros you want to add in front of that million dollar contract. There's no way, and you can book it, no way they could hire him. <laughs> Wouldn't it be hilarious though? <laughs> but it would be absolutely hilarious. Now, I will, I will say he, he, he's in uh, desperate straits, I would say, because sure, sure. There, there are probably few places that would hire him no I, and i would agree with you with that you know um there 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 is a job opening in baton rouge that i believe that could suit his needs and fulfill all the requirements that he would probably have um you know there i don't think this would happen but there is also a private school in los angeles that is looking for a football coach to fill their position, you know, at, at the end of this year. Um, but I just, uh, a, a those programs, a Wazoo retread who was fired in the middle of the season, uh, forget the reasons, but uh, it seems to me that he's going to have to take quite a step back Here's from the, where he was. Right. Here's the problem. You can't forget the reasons why he got canned from, from his show. I mean, you just can't. It, it's going to float out there. It's going to be a black mark on his resume for the rest of his life. Now, would this be something that you of I would be interested in? Oh, I mean, I don't know if he's willing to take the pay cut. It would be a tremendous pay cut in order for this to happen. That would be a coup. Now, here's my thing on it. There's two chances of that happening. Slim and none, and I've left the building. <laughs> okay? I don't think it's going to happen. But, I mean, you know, it doesn't hurt to maybe reach out and say, hey, would this interest you? Well, Steph already said it earlier. I mean, you want to put fans in seats. You want that, that's that, 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 you want media that's the sure way to do it right there. <laughs> you want media coverage. You want fans in seats. You want a storyline to follow. Rolovich to Moscow. I mean, <laughs> you ain't going to get a more yeehaw town that doesn't care about if you get a vaccination card or not than if you go to Idaho. <laughs> so, I mean, you might as well take well, you're job. right. But yeah. you're right. That, it's like, I'll take the $400,000 and not get a vaccine. Yeehaw. <laughs> but, 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 Trevin, you're right. I mean, you know, it, it's not. There is some restrictions, but he wouldn't he wouldn't be as restrained as he would be over on the other side of the board. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, you bring up a very good point. I mean, we're all kind of here sitting here laughing at this stuff. And, and maybe it really is out of their real, you know, the, 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 the realism. Maybe we're all living in a dream world here. But, I mean, this is stranger things have happened. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely kind of funny to think about. Um, and like Trev just said, it would definitely bring a, a lot of excitement. I, I do think, kind of like Nat alluded to, to Though from a, a serious aspect, or, and like you guys have been saying, I mean, he's been taking a really big pay cut. But then on the other side, you know, he's in the middle of a lawsuit right now, and there's a bunch of drama cloud coming around with him. Is that something that Idaho would want to bring in 
dealing with all that, especially considering they are going to, you know, they're going to be looking, I imagine, right away. And he's still in the middle of this lawsuit and, and different things. Um, so maybe they don't even, wouldn't even want that. But, uh, but yeah, it's uh, definitely, uh, definitely funny to think about. I mean, he probably still has a, a home on the police and stuff. I mean, he could just stay here. It, it was interesting. We we uh, our our photographer uh, the the after he was fired at WSU, uh, our photographer snapped a photo of Nick Rolovich at the Vandal game at the Kibbe Dome the following yeah. weekend. And uh, I I'll just uh, mention this: um, uh, the last time I saw a WSU coach at the Kibbe Dome, um, it was uh, Rob Akey. And a few weeks later, he was hired as the uh, Idaho football coach. So, I, oh, I don't... there you go. <laughs> but is he persona non grata? Well, uh, 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 perhaps not at Idaho. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, 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 I kind of think Steph alluded to it. I think there, yes, it would be a big splash, and it would get the media coverage, but. I think there's too much baggage there. Oh, but here's the other thing about that. You know what they say in politics? You know, any media coverage is good coverage. It doesn't matter whether or not it's good or bad. Well, <laughs> I mean, they just got this fancy new basketball arena. They might as well hire Nick Rolovich to get, some, <laughs> get everything popping out. Yeah. We'll see. It would, yes. It would it would get some attention. I I we're, we're talking too much. We're talking this. Too much. I mean, we're talking we're, we're talking <laughs> national news coverage here, folks. Yeah. I mean, he would he, he he would clearly get that kind of coverage. And the WSU and U of I would definitely play a game. They would, they would <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. Would the would schedule. the series would that series get rekindled? Hundred percent out of this. Yeah, I, uh, Rolovich would demand it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> would that be a part of the contract? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll take the big pay cut as long as you give me WSU one time a year. <laughs> I mean, seriously, would he want to get... Would, would, would that be part of the thing? Would he want to get revenge? <laughs> I think so. I, I think we've gone off the deep end now. With... <laughs> <laughs> Well, but this is this is fun. Yeah. Oh, oh, sure. This is the fun stuff. I'm sure that uh, we're not the only ones having these conversations oh, no, tonight. No, way. <laughs> yeah, no, no way. All, all over Vandal Land, uh, Idaho fans are uh, uh, probably mentioning his name more than any others. Well, because... From the same point, the Boise folks. Yes. Well, it's funny. Yeah. I've seen some uh, page on Facebook posted an article about uh, Petrino getting fired today, and there were 16 comments on it. 14 of them were about Rolovich getting hired. <laughs> the... Really? Yeah, getting hired as the coach at U of I. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. It's it's not happening. It's just not happening. It's literally like when. You know, you, you brought up Ohio State, so I'll bring up my Jags fandom for a second. It's like when the Jags <laughs> picked up Tim Tebow, and they were like, Tim Tebow's going to make the 53-man roster. It's just not going to happen. But Tim Tebow didn't oh, have any kind of talent. He was okay. in. Then this is where we go off the deep end. <laughs> yeah, now we went off the deep end, folks. Well, you know, this is kind of like Urban Meyer going to become the next coach of the uh, panels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I you know, we're an hour and 13 minutes in. <laughs> I, I think if anybody's still with us, you know, they're down with all this. Yeah. Think, so we're okay. <laughs> and God bless you, folks. Yeah. yeah. Yes, our, our Trevin here, he uh, has one of the best uh, Jags YouTube channels. That Second. Yes, he is. Second yes, he does. Best. Second best. No, 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 no. It's the best. Let's the, just say okay, it's the best. The best, but the second best numbers one. Uh, 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 well, yeah. you know, whatever. Trevor, tell us where we can find your Jags page. So you can find my Jags YouTube content on Treep Talks, and you can follow me on Twitter at Treep Talks. Twitter's kind of died down to more, mostly uh, the stuff I do here. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's Treep Talk. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other plugs <laughs> they'd like to throw in <laughs> Sorry, I forgot I was the only one under. Hey, I'm a I'm a lost character in a book. That's all I know. 
I've, I've got, <laughs> with my Twitter oh, feed. Steph, Steph's on the phone, but I forgot I was the only one in the room under 40, so I have something. <laughs> hey, hey, oh. hey, listen. Edge Runner Family Films on YouTube. <laughs> I, me and my family make movies. Uh, you need to subscribe, okay? Hey, there might be a film about Paul Petrino and the band. Hey, pause, 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 well, we're just saying random stuff and plugging things. I want to say that we've talked a lot about the Vandals 2016 bowl game. I want to say that was not the best Idaho bowl win. The best Really? The best Idaho bowl win was when the Vandals beat Bowling Green in the humanitarian bowl. Well, okay. I was there for that game. And, uh, yes, in terms of excitement, you are correct. I, what I'm saying is the 2016 win over Colorado State was the most dominant I've Fair. ever seen an Idaho team. Fair. I had so much How can you, oh, wait, 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 wait. How can that be dominant if it was only an 11-point victory? Well, uh, Don, my young friend. <laughs> there. Young, my, yeah. I. I think it yes, it didn't only have been an eleven point game, but Idaho dominated the first two and a half quarters more than I've ever seen an Idaho team dominate anything, uh, I- including exhibition games against Lewis Clark State. <laughs> I didn't they realize they played Normal Hill. They right? need to fit the walkers <laughs> on their schedule. Right. <laughs> but it, it it was really it was remarkable. I remember uh, we were. Uh, I, I was in the office watching the game. We had our crew down in Boise covering it, and it was amazing. It was just stunning to see Idaho. You know, uh, I, I, there are people out there who are listening now, maybe, who who saw <laughs> I, that game. I think our views and ratings are down now. <laughs> maybe. But, it, it, you know, at some point, uh, you know, you didn't expect it to continue, but they were blowing Colorado State out in that game. And I and I, I think Steph mentioned it, just the offensive performance was just clicking on all cylinders, the run game, the pass game, it was all there. Uh, yeah, I, I, in fact, I remember remarking uh, it, it was sort of a down year for Boise State that year, you know, vaguely down. That night, if Boise State had been on the blue turf that night, Daddy got ran. The Vandals would have won that game. Steph? Steph was too drunk that night. <laughs> <laughs> he, he felt... I, don't, I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it definitely, I, I, I 100% agree with Matt though on just how, just how it was just insane how dominant they were and in the, the first few quarters. Um, it was just, it was pretty crazy to watch. Definitely um, surprising. Definitely uh, cool to see. Um, but yeah, I, I guess uh, I, the side note is we were talking about Terry's big decision coming up. Speaking of that, she's going to be talking about that big decision in about eight hours here. And she yeah. And maybe sign off. And, and you, <laughs> uh, hey, you might want to go to bed at some point tonight, Bo. Well, shout bro. out, shout out to Steph. It was fun uh, doing the talk with you guys. It was a lot of fun. Hey Steph, hey, thank you for uh, indulging us for the last hour and twenty minutes. So, uh, I mean, you 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 do need to get a little bit of shut eye, and quite frankly, you know, no dose works pretty well, from what I understand. So Steph needs to go to bed. I think it's time to end the podcast. I also want to say, too, you leaving Nathan Enderley's name off the list of great Idaho quarterbacks is Ooh. also a shame ah. that you didn't, because he won that Bowling Green Bowl, too. He did. The best Idaho He did. He's not a big on for sure. Well, hey, he hey did. Steph. And he sold cars with my dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, Shout he out. dropped. Shout hey, he sold cars. Yeah. Steph, good night, my friend. Yeah, I'll let you guys close it out, but yeah, let's uh, let's do this again sometime. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate it. That, my friends, was Steph Weeby, our U of Idaho football beat writer. And there he goes. And there he goes. <laughs> <It's> terrific. <laughs> well, folks, thanks for hanging with us. If and this you, has been a raucous. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a raucous eighty minutes. <laughs> 
according to the uh, timer yes, on yes. our uh, podcast here. Yeah. So, Matt? so, so, folks, uh, be sure to check out all of Steph's coverage. Uh, uh, the have the story that'll be in uh, Friday morning's Tribune and Daily News. Uh, he'll uh, be on the scene for uh, Terry Golick's uh, news conference on uh, Friday morning. And we will have a follow-up as well as some reaction in Saturday's paper. Very good, yes. So be sure to follow all of that. And, uh, oh, man, thanks for hanging uh, with us this long. Uh, we had a great time. Uh, yeah, as you can tell, it's 2 a.m. Pacific. <laughs> So I hope everybody had a good time listening. Uh, thanks for joining us.